Hi everybody, this is Non-Duality Talk for December 14th, 2015. I'm Jerry Katz. My guest is Locke Kelly, who, um, I'll give you an introduction, but I just want to say hi, Locke. And hey. Welcome. <laughs> Good. Yeah. I, I, I'm just curious about the name Locke, okay? L-O-C-H. <laughs> I mean, I can't, it's like um, the elephant in the room or something, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Tell me about that name. Is it a family thing or what is that about? Yeah, it's it's actually my middle name, uh, which is Loch Lynn, which some people know more, uh, but it means lake land, Loch Lynn. So Loch is um, the Scottish spelling of lake, even though the name okay. is actually Irish. Ah, okay. And, and, and one of my um, students just recently came up to me and she said, uh, I know what your spiritual name is. I said, what? She said, unlock. Okay. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, um, you can play with that a lot. Like if your last name was Smith, you know, with Locksmith, you That's know, right. you can unlock, uh, you have the keys to everybody's heart. That's right. Something See? like that. I like it. There's some kind of marketing scheme there. We'll, we'll work on it. Okay. But you have enough going on. Locke Kelly is the author of the book we're going to talk about, Shift into Freedom, The Science and Practice of Open-Hearted Awareness. Locke is an educator, consultant, and rec recognized leader in the field of non-dual meditation and psychotherapy. And Locke was asked to teach Sutra Mahamudra by Mingyur Rinpoche and asked by Aidy Ashanti to teach non-dual realization. Locke is the founder of the Open Hearted Awareness Institute, which you can access through his website, lockkelly.org, L-O-C-H-K-E-L-L-Y. And Locke Kelly is an emerging voice in modernizing meditation, social engagement, and collaborating with neuroscientists at Yale University of Pennsylvania and NYU to study how awareness training can enhance compassion and well-being. That's a lot. That's I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> words in there that <laughs> you can just open up a lot, you know, yes. meditation and neuroscience, psychotherapy. I mean, so you have it all in this book. Again, shifting to freedom, the science and practice of open-hearted awareness. People can access it through your website, lockkelly.org. It's yep. published by Sounds True, which is a great publisher, and yep. you, people can buy it in Kindle, um, hard copy, and also the CD, yeah. right? <clears throat> well, the CD is actually, interestingly, is not a audio book, but it actually is just the non-dual meditations in the book. So I decided to do it that way because it really, in many ways, is a practice book, meaning it's a book of direct pointing, of glimpsing your true nature, and the unique meditations are kind of the primary reason that I wrote the book. <laughs> you call them, you actually call them glimpse practices. I mean, people yes. can call it exercises, meditations, people have different <laughs> words. Well, why do you call it glimpse practices? So glimpse, um, <clears throat> I distinguish glimpse from experience. So a uh, uh, a glimpse is a direct recognition or realization of who you already are. So rather than a spiritual experience or a meditation meditation state, a glimpse is actually the falling away of that which is in the way of our <clears throat> true nature or the realization of our true nature, which is always here. And so a glimpse is a way to point to or deconstruct or let go or surrender or uncover in a moment, uh, mainly using inquiry or uh, letting go um, to have that which is um, hidden or covered over become primary. And you have about a couple dozen, I guess, of these glimpse practices. Yes. In the book. About 30, I think, yeah. About 30. Yeah. That's in yeah, so it is an interesting word. It's it's a glimpse, a recognition of who you are. And that's yeah. 
separate from an experience. Yes. You seem to be saying. Because the experiencer drops away, the seeker lets go, and the doer um, that begins the journey, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> awareness has to step out or be revealed to be primary. Um, and then, most importantly, is that it's not just a gap or the absence of the of that doer, but there's actually <clears throat> a new kind of knowing from the emptiness that knows in a different way. That's a non-conceptual intelligence um, that knows being, that knows from being, knows being itself. And how do glimpse practices, I mean, how, how uh, so a lot of people are into mindfulness and meditation. Yeah. Oh, well, good thing. I'm not going to judge them. And um, in meditation is a big part of your book. And, you know, when does, is there sometimes like a gray area? I mean, yeah. when, when one experiences or when one has a glimpse or when one resides in this so-called uh, recognition of who one is, there, there may not be a gray area. But at some point, yes. there may be a gray area between yes. this glimpse and an experience. Yes, yeah, early on, there's a there's a definite um, uh, gray area <clears throat> between experience and glimpse, and then there's and it 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 resides around who is glimpsing and <clears throat> the kind of knowing that knows. Um, so even if you're one, if you have a, a direct glimpse, and then one moment later you conceptually think, oh. That was great. I think that was really a glimpse. Then you're you're now out of the glimpse. You're not you're not <clears throat> you're not in in that which is um, the the essential nature, true nature that uh, was revealed. So it's learning. It's kind of learning. It's almost like you know in most traditions there's what's called preliminary practices. So. You could say there's no preliminary practice, but in some ways, any kind of development of <clears throat> any movement toward even the interest in spiritual development or awakening, if anything like that happens, and if anybody goes to a talk, picks up a book, they've already done something. They've already done some preliminary practice. They've thought about it. They've stopped for one moment intentionally. <clears throat> uh, so it's hard it's hard to say unless you've had a complete unintentional awakening which does happen that once you've begun you've you, then you're in the middle of some preliminary practice and because we start where we are we start in our identified condition um, so in our ego centered or whatever you want to call that small self or <clears throat> and and you know, the, the paradox is we're already that awakeness, and yet uh, we don't know it. So <clears throat> the not knowing of who we already are can shift, and that I guess that's one way of talking about awakening is really that the primacy of the, the awake awareness that's already here becomes primary and includes the relative everyday <clears throat> condition condition consciousness uh, but doesn't form an identity in the conditioning the thinker doesn't form a thinker as a center doesn't form a <clears throat> ego center out of the ego functions so the dimension of infinite awareness includes the finite and um, realizes that that you can you can you can live as a human being from this that is beyond uh, being limited by you being a human uh, creature. Well, is that the core of your book? Then it sounds like that's the core of your book: the, the glimpse practices. Yes. So the, I, I would say that the, <laughs> that there are a series of practices that the. <laughs> It's quite a full, as you said in the beginning, um, you know, I bring in neuroscience uh, to support it, some some of what's happening now. 
Um, <clears throat> and I talk about, um, you know, kind of an unfolding that I've seen happen with people that I've both myself and colleagues I've talked to, Adi Shanti, others, and <clears throat> people who have come to me over the last 20 years uh, for individual sessions. So I mostly have not done ongoing traditional psychotherapy the last 20 years I've done um, kind of helping people unfold um, on the <clears throat> on their you know uh, abiding and non-abiding um, integration uh, or recognition of, of who they are and then being able to live from this so uh, so that I talk about what's what I call waking up as the first stage and then waking in to include uh, body and emotion and then waking out, which includes being able to live um, and relate and create from uh, our ground of being, from our true nature. Um, and that becomes more primary and, you know, <laughs> even talk about it as kind of the next natural stage of human development is the ability to awaken and live from open-hearted awareness, which is kind of the phrase for kind of compassionate awareness. Well, let's bring it to what's going on in the world then. I mean, when you read about Donald Trump, it's hard to avoid. <laughs> I mean, how does that make you feel inside? <laughs> what kind of contraction is going on there, to be honest? Uh, yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty hilarious. I mean, I go from like laughing to wait. Wait a minute, what? No, I mean, it literally feels at some point like I'm listening to somebody who's almost a neo-fascist. That you know is is very scary, and then I feel confused, and then I feel sadness, and then I feel like anger, and then you know all the emotional arisings of of <laughs> parts of myself you know, kind of move through because it's so dramatically crazy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's good to hear. I mean, it's not like, I mean, <laughs> if, so you're describing all these emotional yeah. th th fireworks going off and, um, and that's cool to hear. So if someone feels like, well, you know, I'm non-dual, I don't really feel right. any of this or I'm going to plane beyond all that. That's right. Maybe that's a little, uh, like avoiding what's going on, man. I mean, you should be. A person should be. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I exactly. find that it, that it is that is often a stage that people can get stuck in is kind of <clears throat> that initial stage of waking up out of dualistic mind into the freedom from, you know, both ego-centered and even your <clears throat> body and emotions kind of going beyond into a sense of, pure awareness, but if you remain in there, then you're detached and uh, kind of an observing witness from awareness or denying <clears throat> the, the next, what seems to be the next stage when I've talked to many people about what unfolds naturally is, is then <clears throat> with that awareness as the primary dimension of intelligence and being there's an including of the human uh and so <clears throat> you know like the famous zen story is you know asked when you know an awakened master you know what about emotions and he says when i'm happy i laugh when i'm sad i cry hmm. yeah. so <laughs> that you you be you you have a full a full a full human life rather than being transcendent and how much of your in your book you you um how do you address that yeah so i i mean i talk about um <clears throat> this kind of almost like a a map of traditional kind of almost like principles of awakening or stages that happen <clears throat> you know in some ways there's there's always what is so there's no stages on the ultimate level there's no stages on the Relative level, you know, you can get stuck in stages of uh, <clears throat> human development that actually have almost nothing to do with it. But then when the two come together, the awareness and the 
human <clears throat> condition, then there seems to be these kind of um, movements from waking up out of and then having awareness become aware of itself as that which is the intelligence that's not conceptual thinking and not ego-centered. And then there's a movement or uh, <clears throat> a realization, I guess you could say it like the you know, the Mahayana saying that first form realizes its emptiness, then emptiness realizes it's none other than form. So that movement seems to be very important. And I kind of, um, my glimpses and pointers move, uh, help uh, use um, a kind of inquiry process of actual experiential um movement of awareness out of experience to have awareness realize uh, itself directly as formlessness and then realize itself as none other than form and feel uh, then there's a kind of heart-mind quality that doesn't have to go back up to uh, conceptual thought to create an intellectual uh, philosophy about what's going on. We're talking to Lot Kelly, and the book is Shift into Freedom, the Science and Practice of Open-Hearted Awareness. LotKelly.org. Um, you, you know, you talk about ego, so ego identification. Yes. And, uh, and I think you characterize it or separate or um, distinguish it from ego functions. Yes. And, and ego personality, too. Mm. Yeah, can you talk about that? And <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, in some ways it's, you know, from a kind of non-dual non perspective, I guess first thing is kind of, I find that there's often two definitions of non-dual going around. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's not necessarily always aligned with, you know, one uh, spiritual tradition or the other, but one definition of non-duality is that uh, when you leave the dualistic mind and realize that you are pure awareness <clears throat> and or oneness or unity consciousness that's beyond all form, that's non-duality. Non-duality is non-dual awareness, which is using the word non-dual to mean pure awareness. And the other definition of non-dual is you realize that you're that pure awareness, then the next phase is the pure awareness realizes it's none other than appearance or form or aliveness or energy or humanity. And that those two, um, what's called the two truths in Buddhism, is that ultimate reality and relative reality are the same, or in Hinduism, um, you know, <clears throat> the world is an illusion, only Brahma is real, is one, is two-thirds of the truth, and then the third statement is, uh, the world is Brahma. So that, that realization is, is, is a sense that there is <laughs> simultaneously infinity, pure awareness as primary, appearing as oneness, manyness, and particularness. So the particular is that there are these human creatures and animals and trees that have relative uh, uniqueness. And within us, we have uh, a function that relates to our, you know, from our DNA to our uh, name and personal history and memory and conditioning that's different, mine is different than yours, and you have a name, Jerry, and I have a name, Locke, and there's a ego function that remembers where I live and, and which key goes into my house's door and has a certain sense of humor and likes certain foods and doesn't like certain foods, and there's no problem with any of that. There's no problem on, on, in terms of awakening with personality with story even, like your story, meaning I grew up here and 
this is my name and these are my parents and I work at this and I don't do that, that it's the identification with first would be thinking you're only your body, only your story, only your um, personality. But really what it is, is that ego identification is actually a very <laughs> particular pattern of thought, looping on thought, connecting to ego function that creates a little sense of self-reflecting pattern in our consciousness that we are so identified with that we don't even see it, that it's what's looking out of our eyes as if there's a little mini-me behind our eyes looking out of our head, looking, you know, at objects. And it isn't thinking that's the problem, it isn't story, it isn't personality, it's this patterning that when it relaxes, which is what these glimpses and pointers do, it relaxes just that pattern uh, that's patterning by itself. When that pattern relaxes, uh, most people will immediately, I mean, 80 to 90% of people off the street in 15 minutes to half an hour will have a glimpse just by relaxing that pattern of self-referencing, <clears throat> self-looping, thought that creates the sense of a thinker as primary and then that uh, ego identification, the identification which is we're not actually identifying with anything like craving or aversion, that's not the identification, it's actually the identification of the pattern with itself, that's the ego identification. It's doing it by itself and when it relaxes uh, and then when that awareness that's revealed can then become aware of itself by itself and then allow everything actually to continue to arise without forming a little point of view um, called a self or self-referencing point, then um, the experience that people report immediately is one of emptiness and fullness of joy and bliss of sense of interconnection and wonder and a sense of mainly freedom from uh, a certain kind of suffering that <clears throat> is the suffering of self that that is what's called dukkha or um, you know perpetual dissatisfaction now the book shift into freedom in into we were talking about this shift yes but part of the title then is the science and practice yes. of open-hearted awareness of so the practice then you we've talked about the glimpse practices although yes. you haven't taken us through one maybe you will in a little I while sure. have to. but you also mentioned the science and specifically i yeah. guess that's neuroscience yeah. so um what can you say about neuroscience as far as ego and or the self i mean what's you know what's the scientific basis for this the self so you know the 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 many many you know with 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 neuroscience where it is today it certainly made some leaps and bounds but i'm sure we will discover it's in its infancy like many other things but there's at least a good dialogue and some good pointers um now where many neuroscientists are basically able to look with the fmri particularly uh this huge magnet system that can see the not only the structures of the brain and the <clears throat> but the activity that's going on uh the way i say it is that uh, the brain the brain is a symphony but no conductor can be found mm -hmm. so there's no center um of a self that's organizing uh what's going on the activity even an action <clears throat> that you intend to take uh, they find that the, the, there's movement in the brain before you know you've made a choice to push a lever. It's already, the, the activity of the brain's already moved to that place of choice. I don't like it. Right? I don't like that whole idea. I don't want the brain to do that. I don't want the brain knowing what I'm going to do before I know what I'm going to do. Okay. Is All there right, any way, can I get a pill for that? Or? 
we can, we can, we can skip the, the implications of that one. But, I, you know, I have a, that's a funny one, too. I think that's kind of a funny one as well. I'm not, uh, I don't follow that out to mean a whole lot, except that um, there's some sense that we're not the doer, that, you know, on that level. <clears throat> and then, you know, on other, on other levels, there's a sense of a whole, of the whole organism is really awake and, and that it's not only limited to ourselves that we're, you know, part of an interactive, you know, field. And what neuroscience um, is seeing is a couple couple different things that are that have been very helpful um, in terms of um, you know seeing that uh, there's a way we're continually distracted or return back to this what I calling the mini me, not only consciously but unconsciously in a rhythm that happens in the brain called the default mode network, it takes us on a regular basis looking out into the world, then it takes us looking in and it takes us looking out and it takes us looking in. And when it looks in for any, any period of time, it creates a daydream state. And the daydream most of the time has a little character <laughs> that is this um, this me character that's looking for satisfaction in the area of like dream and futuring and past and if only had I said that and if only I did this and it leads to a kind of dissatisfaction. It's not even about us, the biological creature. It's this little dissatisfied uh, mental pattern that thinks it's an entity. And the, that feeling when it thinks it's an entity feels like it has to go and crave uh, and get something to satisfy it or protect itself. But there's no food for it to eat. And there's nothing that can threaten it because it's not a thing. It's just a pattern that when it relaxes, no one died. No, <laughs> So there's a sense of um, the brain shows that people who are kind of in a ground of baseline uh, awakening have this feeling of being seamlessly interconnected inside and out and non-self-referential and the areas of the brain related to kind of a subtle bliss in the body is is going on and there's a, a sense of uh, the compassionate centers are more active empathy. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of some support for um, showing that this is not all delusional. This is not all just philosophy um, or feel-good belief system. Like, oh, I'm, you know, because it's so, so hard to be somebody, I'll just believe in non-duality. I'll believe I'm nobody and then I'm infinite and I'll live forever. And, oh, that's a great belief system and I feel better. It's, it shows that it's not exactly that, that you actually are, that those feelings are coming from a change in consciousness. That when the consciousness changes, the next um, dimension is a freedom from these kind of suffering, fear-based, anxiety-driven uh, patterns that people have that just relax. And... Again, staying on neuroscience, I mean, some people are working with uh, different uh, technologies. And you mentioned earlier that what we what we know, what neuroscience knows so far is probably, you know, minuscule compared to what's going to be yes. found out. Right. Well, what's gonna, what do you think is going to be found out? I mean, kind of, uh, you know, put on your visionary hat there for <laughs> a second. Uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, again, it's like, um, it's hard to speculate um, beyond direct experience um, that, you know, that there is some interconnection in the whole universe and that there's some um, pattern that you, whether you want to call it evolutionary, I call it developmental, just because I know developmental experience and see how people change in a, you know, from a child to an adult, um, that 
there's a developmental sense of identity that's limited that creates um, that creates dissatisfaction perpetually and that projects it out onto other people and then makes us feel separate and creates division and ends up thinking and talking like Donald Trump because it sees the world as 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 divided and threatened and and whether it's that form of how it looks or whether it's starting wars or feeling that even in a you know trying to have a good relationship with somebody you love there's some part that's always looking for an argument or that that pattern will be discovered to be um, kind of a developmental uh, identity pattern that can be grown out of and when it is I think people will become more loving and people will will come up with creative solutions to things um, that they uh, they don't can't even see right now. Oh, let's just stay with Donald Trump yep. there for a second. I mean, <laughs> um, do you know for sure that he's not spiritually enlightened? I don't know. I'm just I'm just playing with you okay. a little. We're using him as a yeah. as a foil tonight. We're but just, I just want to yeah. But I just want to give play, that being playful with him, right? I just want to give that little perspective that yes, you know sure. we're not no no judging him or acting as though. No. You know, we're in a light. Are you? You know, our gang is in light, and, and, and he's not. Right. right. No, and not not about politics or that. No, I'm. You know, I'm being playful because you were being. I thought you were yeah. being a little playful in the beginning, and you know, it's it's not to, not exactly as you said. It's not to be. We're right and he's wrong, or <clears throat> we're liberal and he's conservative, or something like that. But it's it's about division and creating us and them and those patterns, whatever those are, we can find them. I can find them in myself, my own arising of, of thoughts and feelings that arise. But when they create, uh, and I've felt before and I feel in certain moments they'll catch me, but there's another developmental um, awareness that is, you know, doesn't take long now to see that almost like a cartoon character has arrived in my head and I'm starting to, you know, talk to my wife about, well, what do you mean? You, you know, I thought you were going to get the, you know, you said you were going to, and then I'm like, well, and then we both end up laughing like so quickly because it's, it's like an old character yeah. of like, it's your fault. It's my fault. Uh, 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 <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's easy to fall into that, but then yeah. it's easy to fall out of it. That's right. And that's the thing is that, that when that becomes more primary, it's, it is almost like you've gone to a developmental stage where when you were two year old, you know, two, two years old, you, you know, I see, you know, like a grand nephew that, you know, is just mine, mine, mine. And then, you know, a year later is like, oh, here, sharing, 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 you know, so... Hmm. So you see that, that that kind of change is not just something, oh, we have to continually deal with these. It literally can become like a stage that it's no longer it's no longer the primary pattern. It doesn't disturb um, on, a, on a continual basis. It becomes little blips of old conditioning and, you know, that, that there's no doubt that... <clears throat> There's there's something going on that awakening can become the new normal that that it does make a huge difference it it can become um, you know really embodied like a, include your full humanity and you don't have to feel like you can't have those first feelings the conditioning arise like some you know agitation but then the agitator the judge doesn't judge judgment and the the fear, the fearful one doesn't get afraid of fear arising. So you just feel your feelings from this expansive, boundless, embodied, infinite, loving, embracing presence that becomes, you know, you know, just the new normal. The new normal. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking to Locke Kelly. Lockkelly.org. The book is Shift into Freedom, the Science and Practice of 
Open Hearted Awareness, published by Sounds True, great publisher. Yep. You um, you got a lot of really nice reviews. People really yeah sink their teeth into your book and you know highly recommended. Yes. Um, just on this technology, as you were talking about it, I was thinking the technology of awakening. I mean, does that? You know, I mean, it, we, it has to be, you know, it's being done and it's being looked at and everything and, and that's fine and everything, but it just seems too technical, too technological to me. It's like people are going to be marched into a room and they'll, uh, <laughs> you know, become present and then they'll get out, you know, next. And I don't know. Do you have that sense a little? Uh, do you mean like technology, like neuroscience or like, yeah. you mean uh, more, what do you mean by that? Technology? I guess I can mean... Um, <clears throat> I guess I can mean technological, you know, hardware in some way, or just oh, yeah. um, based on findings in neuroscience. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think neuroscience is like a little lens that's looking at and uh, some of the changes that are happening kind of verifies really kind of from a scientific, uh, hopefully, you know, observer, like here's what, here's what, your brain looked like before you seem to have all this anxiety and fear based areas were firing, you know, and now they're not, in fact, your compassionate area. So I see that technology more as a, you know, just kind of viewing objectively uh, to verify that there's real changes, you know, on that level. And, Yet, you can also be in fear, <laughs> just to say that you can also at the same time be in complete fear and feel completely free of the fear. So your brain mm -hmm. could show fear and your consciousness, your awareness could be completely free. So it's not like it's, I want to be clear that it's not um, associating brain with mind or brain with awareness so that so on that level, yeah, I mean, it, it certainly can't be, um, you know, the technology is not not so, not important. Uh, it's just kind of a dialogue with the whole of uh, modern, you know, or contemporary culture. I think there's a way that there's no doubt something real is going on with awakening and that it can become, you know, the way 40 years ago yoga, you know, was weird and then became you know, is on every corner in New York City, <laughs> you know, and 20 years ago, mindfulness meditation was, you know, still, you know, thought to be out of the norm and is now studied by and become part of regular culture. So I think awakening is then, you know, kind of what yoga and mindfulness are the preliminary practices for awakening. So whether you don't even have to go through yoga or mindfulness, but there's no doubt that there's something here that can be clarified about what is it and what are the traps. So that kind of science of uh, recognition and objectively discussing with colleagues, you know, what are the traps, you know, what do you do? Can you shift your consciousness intentionally or do you have to just passively wait for, you know, luck or grace or unintentional because there's no doer, therefore there's nothing to do? Or is there actually some kind of inquiry uh, dynamic where you have awareness has intentionality, which is what I found. And that's a lot of what the uh, pointers and glimpses are about is that I use um, an inquiry um, way of shifting into freedom, which is having local awareness look back through the meditator, look through, back through the ego, through the meditator to discover itself, which it was never separate from. But there's an ability for uh, awareness to intentionally unhook from the mind uh, and discover it's always been here and has always been inherent within everything, but that um, movement of awareness is is the very particular uh, way of inquiring that these uh, glimpses um, are are 
are able to be used by these people that you were saying had, you know, were reviewing the book and the practices. Well, I think it's accessible. Once you get a feel for it, it's, it's almost like balancing, learning to balance on a bicycle. You get a feel for it and then you go like, oh, I got it. Oh, there I am. Now I can intentionally balance. Oh, now I can intentionally shift out of my chattering mind into this pure awareness and then realize the pure awareness is inherent within me. And then I'm in open hearted awareness or heart mind. And now I can create and relate and begin to uh, kind of rewire functioning and begin to learn how to walk and talk and type and, and do everything from um, a new dimension of, of being. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it is, it's great that people can, uh, you know, can access that through your book and through so many other yeah. places and people and ways and experiences and, you know, just so much. I mean, in the last 15 or 20 years, it's, that's, that's come out and mostly through the internet and, uh, yeah. and, and so, you know, you're offering a powerful way. So how would, um, so let's say let's say you engage the engage the listener in a, a yeah. glimpse practice. Sure. Which one would you choose? And uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, the in in some ways there's there's kind of as I was talking about <clears throat> these principles and these kind of uh, movements of waking up out of ego identification and then waking into awake awareness and then awake awareness waking <clears throat> into your body so we can you know we can do like a short initial initial one um that uh that at least gives you a feel of how um you can intentionally have a little uh a little bit of a sense of what it would be like to to um intentionally surrender or drop or shift awareness let's say let's do one um like shifting from head to heart space uh so okay. i could i could lead you through that so um mm -hmm. the the sense is without even knowing quite what it is that the that we're our awareness is identified or attached uh to uh, thinking and ego function and feels like it's it's behind our eyes it feels like that there's a little <clears throat> sense of me that's not equally distributed through our body but really feels like somehow because of our senses in our head uh, and because of this patterning that we're identified or attached to that sense of of uh, self uh, or ego center behind our eyes mm -hmm. so um, the possibility is that awareness as kind of a globe of awareness which it, uh, can unhook the intelligence the center of, of, of knowing from thinking and actually as that awareness takes a step back it can feel and know directly uh, from within your jaw from within your throat uh, and so instead of looking down now i'm just i'm still giving the preliminary kind of uh instruction and then we'll go through it but it can actually unhook from thinking and the awareness which is the uh what is actually knowing prior to thought can know directly from within your body and from within your heart space so that you won't be looking down from the tower of your head like you do when you're kind of bringing your attention to your breath in your body and you're located in your head and looking down or concentrating or focusing or doing a mindful attention will actually be relocating the center of your consciousness out of your thinking mind and into the heart space, which has the ability to open up um, infinitely, and yet, uh, well, you'll you know you'll feel what it's like. So, mm -hmm. so I'll just 
invite the reader um, and the listeners to um, – you, you can have your eyes open or closed, whatever's most comfortable, and just feel that sense of identification or normal way of perceiving where you're looking out of your eyes and feeling uh, identified with thoughts and sounds coming to your head. And then feel without even knowing how, you, how you're doing it as if this globe of awareness, which is the intelligence, can unhook from thought, step back out of that bandwidth of thinking, and then drop, begin to drop down so you feel like awareness is knowing your jaw directly from within, and then feel like an elevator going down or a leaf floating, that awareness is knowing your throat directly from within, and then feel that awareness dropping and knowing your upper body directly below your neck from within until your awareness drops into this space in your center of your chest, this heart space, so that you're not looking up to thought to know and you're not going down to sleep. So feel as if awareness has unhooked, dropped, knowing now directly from within your senses and knowing directly from within your body until you open up this heart space which opens up outside of your body, in front and back, all around, so you feel a kind of boundless ground that can welcome all thoughts and experience, doesn't need to go to sleep, and yet doesn't need to go to thought. And just notice this kind of quieting of thought or thought-free, spacious awareness, a sense of embodied awareness, a sense of freedom from that sense of self located in one place. So freedom from that ego center, and yet knowing the aliveness within you, knowing the effervescent energy and the space and awareness, and knowing the spaciousness outside of you as well, behind you, in front of you, to the left, to the right, sense of boundless support or freedom. So if you're eyes are closed, you can gently open your eyes and stay as if you're dropped down out of that mini-me. You're, you're dropped out of that identity. You're dropped out of conceptual thinking. You're feeling this aliveness, embodiment, but the body is also spacious, empty, boundless, inclusive, interconnected, oneness, unity, but also here. Very simple. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's the uh, title of your book is Shift into Freedom, and that's like an experience, that's the experience, experiential uh, title, so to speak. Yes, exactly. That's right. So that's a, a little one of the one of the little short practices, mainly to feel that you really can step out, not only of conceptual thinking, but also of that location of um, the I or the the self that's organizing. And once you drop out of that patterning. Uh, you'll naturally be opened up, even if I didn't give those clues or those pointers toward what you're finding. You know, sometimes I'll just say, okay, just unhook, drop, and now report. And people who walk off the street with no background will report the same thing um, consistently. Yeah. 
And what other qualities, what, what are some of the qualities uh, specifically that they mention? I mean, the, the, the interesting ones are they're often in paradoxical pairs. So someone will say, what, I'll say, what's here? And they'll say, emptiness. And then the next person will say, fullness. And then someone will say, freedom. And then the next one will say, love. And the next one will say, boundlessness. And the next one will say, completely embodied. You know, like, so it's almost mm -hmm. like this amazing. Then someone will say, uh, oneness. And the next person will say, interconnected, unique uh, appreciation of everyone and everything for exactly what they are, just as they are. So it's this kind of uh, freedom from that um, limitation of one or the other. Yeah. You have a sense of that? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, that's um, yeah. Because I mean, doing doing the interview and being here, and I'm hearing, you know, yeah. my, my my chest freezer is turning on, and I can hear. Yeah. I'm thinking of that, you know, I'm trying to do an interview. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh God, I got to get rid of that sound. <laughs> so then, so that's in the, you know, that kind of, yeah, you know, um, it's kind of a head thing. Yeah. And uh, so then, you know, then pretty easy then to, then to uh, experience that shift then. Yeah. It's, it's a different, you know, quality. Yeah. And that's the glimpse. That's the glimpse that you're. That's the glimpse. That's the exercise. That's the practice. Yeah. And then, so then a question or an inquiry I would ask there is, so once people are, you know, I kind of ask, well, what's here, you know, rather than who's here or what are you aware of what's here? And then, so they'll say emptiness and freedom and boundlessness and love. And then I'll inquire this way, which your listeners can inquire too. So if you, if you're aware of this freedom, this sense of boundlessness and alive, non-conceptual awareness. Are you aware of that freedom or are you actually the freedom that's aware of thoughts, feelings, and sensations? Are you aware of the spacious awareness or are you the spacious awareness to which thoughts, feelings, sensations that you formerly took to be you are now arising. Yeah, and and the investigation continues and goes on. Yeah. And what about, I think we're just about out of time, but okay. um, I wanted to ask you about, some people talk about, um, you know, um, short glimpses, short glimpses yes, of the self. Right. Um, do you, how do you feel about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's kind of the training. I remember we were talking in the beginning about you know, preliminary practices and there's a, there's a place where, you know, the, the non-dual steps out of the preliminary practices, but it, and it goes to glimpsing or to recognition or to realization or abiding, but often initially, uh, short glimpses only last because you're not trying to make them stay. So the old habit will, will take you back to identification with um, with your this pattern of mini me that I was talking about will kind of reconnect itself and then what I say is no big surprise that that happened just re-recognize and so you again just glimpse again just unhook drop open include and what's moving and what's doing that is actually the awareness once awareness unhooks from the doer and from thought Awareness actually has intentionality. In other words, you're able to live from awareness with making movement and intention, but that's not the doer. That's actually the multidimensional quality of awareness. And that, but there is some kind of letting go and letting be, um, and then losing it and then coming back. And that becomes kind of the familiarization that then spontaneously starts staying longer and you're starting to you start to rewire by talking from here and and moving from here uh, and then you lose it again and then you return so I'm you know very much uh, think that's 
the you know the intentional uh, way of of glimpsing as small glimpses uh, many times. Yeah, people can access that then through your book and the CD, yes. which consists of the uh, uh, glimpse practices. So thank you very much, Locke Kelly. Appreciate that. Yes. Thank, thank you, you very too. much for being here. Locke Kelly website is lockkelly.org, L-O-C-H-K-E-L-L-Y. The book is Shift into Freedom, the Science and Practice of Open-Hearted Awareness. It's an important book. It's a really important book. And if anybody yeah. wants to do what you're talking about, Great. Uh, get the glimpse and, and live through it uh, yes. in an ongoing way. And... Um, I just want to read something that you wrote in the book. You, sure. you, you wrote, I designed this book and these practices to encourage experiences of the simplest and deepest dimensions of our human experience in the midst of our daily life. We all have the potential to recognize awake awareness, which brings true peace of mind and an open heart. That's what we've been talking about. Thanks very much, Locke. Thank you, Jerry. I really, really enjoyed talking to you. And this is Non-Duality Talk. Our website is nonduality.org. I'm Jerry Katz. Thank you for listening. <laughs>